In today's video, I'll cover how you can burn tokens. The way that you burn tokens is pretty similar in both ERC721 and for ERC20, so I'll cover both in this one video. To burn a token means to destroy it, and this generally means that you're decreasing the token supply. You may want to burn a token if your token is inflationary, which means that new tokens are constantly being created, so you want to prevent the supply from getting out of control. As another example, you might have a game in which tokens might correspond to items like potions or food or power-ups, and after being consumed, that token should be destroyed so that you cannot reuse it. There are at least two ways to burn a token. One way is to send a token to the dead address or the zero address. That zero address is not controlled by anyone, so any token that ends up being owned by that address cannot be transferred out of that address ever. A second option is for a smart contract to expose burn functionality, for example, through the burnable interface. The second approach of using the burnable interface is better because it better suits the idea of what people have in mind when they think of destroying. Let's think about NFTs, for example. In most ERC721 smart contracts, you have an internal mapping which will map from a token ID to the address who owns that token. With the first approach of sending the token to the zero address, if you just send that token to the zero address, then that token is still going to exist in the mapping, but it's simply going to point to the zero address. So the token still exists, and it's not really destroyed. Let's look at a more concrete example. Let's say you have an NFT smart contract with a total supply of two, so Bob owns token IDs one and two. Now let's say Bob wants to burn token ID one by sending token one to the zero address. In the end, the total supply in that smart contract is still two tokens, and Bob owns token ID two and the zero address still owns token ID one. So you meant to burn the token, but you still ended up with a total supply of two, which might be confusing for some people. Now who can burn a token? Generally, there are three tiers of permissions. The first one is that the owner, of course, can burn their own token. Secondly, the owner can give permission to an account and give them access to several tokens. The third option is that an owner can give approval over all of their tokens to another party, which is called an operator. Typically, this might be a wallet or exchange. So this means that when you use a wallet or exchange, you're signing over permission for all of your tokens to that wallet or exchange. Now let's talk about the ERC721 burnable interface that's implemented by OpenZeppelin. This interface inherits from the ERC721 interface, and it allows burning by calling the burn method from erc721.soul. Right now I'm on the OpenZeppelin page on version 4.x. To look up the burnable interface, we'll check out the API reference. The interface exposes just one method called burn, which takes in the token ID that you want to burn. So let's check out the code on the GitHub. We see that burnable inherits from ERC721, and here's our burn method. The caller must own the token ID or it must be an approved operator. On line 23, we're checking to make sure that the caller of the burn method is approved or is an owner. And then we're calling the burn method from ERC721. Now let's look at what this burn method is doing internally. To do that, we'll go back up and then we'll click on erc721.soul. And then we can search for burn. So in the comments, we can see that calling burn will destroy the token ID and the approval is cleared when the token is burned. On line 309, we are clearing the approvals and then we're subtracting one from the balances of that owner. So then if that owner tries to check their balance on this ERC721 smart contract, they'll see that their balance is decreased by one. And then we're deleting that token ID from the owner's mapping. So let's look up what this owner's mapping is. So this burn method is actually deleting that key value pair from this mapping. As I showed earlier in the slide, this is, this is exactly what we want because we don't simply want this address to be replaced by the zero address. We actually want the smart contract to think that this token is deleted. And the best way to do that is for to actually remove all traces of that token from the internal data structures that this contract is using to store the state. Another thing to note in this burn method is that it's internal which means that this method can only be called from within this contract or from a contract that inherits from this contract. This means that in your own NFT smart contract, if you simply inherit from erc721.soul, but you do not inherit from burnable, your users do not have a way to call this burn function because it's internal. The Board Ape Yacht Club NFT contract is an example of that. So here in Etherscan, we have the Board Ape Yacht Club contract. And in the Board Ape Yacht Club code, if we search for burn, we can see that on line 1701, the contract does have the burn method and it's internal. But because the contract does not expose the burnable interface, there's no way for users to call burn here, which means that the board apes cannot be burned. We can also see this on line 1366. We see that the contract inherits from ERC721 metadata and ERC721 enumerable. 
but it does not inherit from burnable. That's why if you go to the right contract, you don't see any method that will allow you to burn an ape because it's not possible to burn an ape. If we go to read contract, if you check the total supply, you can see it's 10,000 and the total supply is always 10,000 because it's not possible to burn apes. For bored apes, the best you can do for burning is to send an ape to the zero address. However, this does not decrease the total supply. If you want to allow your users to burn tokens and destroy them and also affect the total supply, then you might want to think about using something like burnable. Please let me know in the comments below if you have any questions or if you have any other standards or contracts or code that you'd like me to review. If you found this helpful, please give a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.